Well, good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's January 4th, 2024 open session. Ms. Kostrova, would you please take the roll? Certainly. Uh, Commissioner Cozart? Here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McMahon? Good afternoon. Thank you. Commissioner Stidham? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Argo? I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Hewlett? Here. Thank you. Chair Goodman? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Green? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Wright? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon? Commissioner Dixon? Here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cash? And Commissioner Davis and Commissioner Giacchetti. Here. Uh, I'll note that Marcella Costa, the Executive Director, and Skyler, General Counsel, Diane Sullivan with the Urban Design and Plan Review Division, and, and Elizabeth Miller with um, uh, Physical Planning are also in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coster. And noting the presence of a quorum, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Today's meeting is being live streamed and will be available in a few days as a video on NCPC's website. If there's no objection, the agenda as posted is adopted as the order of business. And now please join me uh, as a short video clip of the Pledge of Allegiance is, is played. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America and to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, liberty, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. NCPC will continue to conduct its meetings online until the renovations in the commission chambers have been completed. I want to share how we will be conducting commission business today and following our staff presentations and any other testimony, I will ask for a motion in a second as appropriate. During commission deliberations, I'll use the round robin format to ask each of the commissioners if they have any comments. During the deliberations, commissioners should be on video unless you are experiencing technical difficulties. Um, so uh, the agenda item number two is report of the chair. And I just want to say, Happy New Year, and it's um, wonderful to see all of you here today. As staff noted, we have a fairly light agenda. Um, I think Commissioner Wright, um, uh, who's been here for many, many years and is a, our veteran, said that she's never seen an agenda this light. But we're excited to hear the presentations today. Uh, and uh, I think as we um, consider the work of the commission in the past year, uh, I'm happy to let you know that the NCPC staff has recently released their 2023 year in review. It highlights the Beyond Granite uh, program and also the Pennsylvania Avenue initiative, which we'll hear about again today. Uh, there, are other, there are several other high profile projects that have been reviewed and I encourage all of you to take a look at that. This has all been a reminder to me of how important the work is that we do. I know that uh, General Services Administrator uh, Robin Carnahan, by letter, has advised me that Elliot Dooms, um, uh, Commissioner, PBS Commissioner, and Melanie Gilbert were new commission um, member or commission member alternates, along with Mina Wright and Christy Turnstall, Turn, Tunstall Williams. So I do want everyone to be aware of that. And agenda item number three is the report of the Executive Director, Mr. Marcella Costa. Marcella. Thank you, Chair Goodman, and Happy New Year. The public is invited to attend two upcoming meetings to discuss the updated Comprehensive Plan Introduction Chapter and Submission Guidelines, which the Commission reviewed last month. An online meeting is scheduled for January 25th and an in-person meeting on February 20th. Please visit our website to review the draft updates and to RSVP for the meetings. Also, have two personnel announcements. Management and program analyst Kana Williams has been with the agency since 2016 and has recently accepted a position with the National Institutes of Health. We thank Kana for her service as our facilities and record manager over the past eight years and wish her the best of luck in her new role at NIH. After 23 years as commission graphic designer, Paul Jutton has retired. 
Paul has made every NCPC plan, web page, newsletter, and public event engaging and visually interesting. He developed our current logo and was a driving force behind the agency's recently launched online planning library, an upcoming centennial exhibit, which you'll learn about today. We'll certainly miss Paul and we wish him all the best in his future endeavors. You do have my written report in your packet. I'm happy to answer your question. Then just by the way, in February, we do expect a very busy meeting. Thank you, Mr. Acosta. Does anyone on the commission have a question for Mr. Acosta? Hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number four, and that is uh, the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and Happy New Year to you and members of the commission. Uh, I do have nothing to report today. All right. Any questions for Ms. Schuyler? Hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item number five, which is the consent calendar. And there are two consent calendar items. The first is for approval of the final site and building plans for the multi-level parking garage at the National Institutes for Health um, in Bethesda, Maryland. The second is for approval of the final site and building plan at the uh, Children's Inn Renovation and Expansion at 7 West Drive, Bethesda, also for the National Institute of Health. Um, do the commissioners have any questions on, on regarding either one of these projects at this time? Any Move questions? the approval. Very good. Thank you for that motion, Commissioner second. Anderson. And second, thank you, um, Vice Chair. Um, Ms. Coster, could you confirm the motion in the second and vote? take the vote, please, by roll call? Certainly. Uh, the motion was made by Commissioner Dixon and seconded by Vice Chair Hewlett. With that, Commissioner Kozar? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Uh, Vice Chair Hewlett? Yes. Uh, Chair Goodman? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, just double checking, Commissioner Cash? And Commissioner Giacchetti? Abstain. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. The motion has carried. For the remainder of the agenda, we will hear information presentations from staff. Agenda item number 6A is an information presentation on the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative. Mr. Jamawat, could you please proceed when you are ready? All right, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Good men and commission members. The purpose of today's information presentation is to provide Today, I keep getting the pop-up. Um, One point Jeff, uh, if you can, uh, would you, uh, we're ha we did have some difficulty hearing you, so perhaps um, uh, if you want, I'll ask uh, Mr. Champ to pull up the slides for you, and then you can go ahead and give the presentation. Um, Mr. Champ, if you can go ahead and do that, um, we'll give you a minute or two. Great, thank you. Looks good, see it. So Mr. Jamawat, um, I think go ahead and proceed and we'll make sure that we can hear you uh, during your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Goodman and Commission members. The purpose of today's information presentation is to provide an update on the Pennsylvania Avenue Initiative. Next slide, please. 
The project area is a 1.2 mile segment of Pennsylvania Avenue between the White House and the US Capitol, encompassing about 40 acres of adjoining public spaces, adjacent blocks, and intersecting streets. Guided by the 1974 plan, the study area has complex jurisdictional structure with several federal and district agencies responsible for different aspects of the corridor. In 2023, NCPC worked with GSA to secure the funding and enter into a partnership with the Park Service, District Government, the Downtown DC Business Improvement District, and Events DC to prepare the new Pennsylvania Avenue plan. Next slide. In 2018, the Executive Committee published their findings and a strategic action plan outlining the near, medium, and long-term activities to prepare the new plan. The findings for the outcome of several foundational studies. The committee's work led to several catalytic action, and after consulting with a multidisciplinary panel of experts, the committee agreed on a new vision for the avenue. This direction was reinforced by the district ULI report in 2020 that underscore how investment in public space and civic infrastructure can help spur economic activities and revitalize downtown post COVID. In fact, we're just so delighted that the mayor incorporated Pennsylvania Avenue into her economic development strategy for the district, including the forthcoming downtown action plan. Next slide. Federal and local stakeholders agree on a new vision that the avenue should be a beautiful street designed for people first. And the highest and best use is the avenue as a venue elevated as America stage for events of national and global significance. These new events will supplement the existing local and regional events on Pennsylvania Avenue today. Also, the avenue can help reduce over-programming at the National Mall by hosting events that are more appropriate for its urban character, as well as bringing events and critical mass of tourists closer to downtown. Next slide. The partner agency also agreed that the avenue needs to be a better street for daily life, a destination that prioritizes pedestrian, bike, and transit, with more comfortable and engaging public spaces for people to enjoy every day, all day, and into the evening. Next slide. As a reminder, in 2022, the Commission released a vision and three early concepts for public comments. By the end of the four and a half months comment period, NCPC received over 450 comments. We also hosted public meetings and met one-on-one -on -one with a range of stakeholders, including in-person events on the avenue. We learned from each engagement that people are motivated, inspired, and are very excited about the future of Pennsylvania Avenue. Next slide. On behalf of the project partners, SCPC is seeking two consultant teams through two separate RFP to develop critical components of the new plan. The first RFP was issued in September and focuses on the implementation program. The consultant will develop the program of requirements for special events, perform economic analysis, and develop the business case for the new vision and recommend a new stewardship entity to administer, operate, maintain the avenue, which is critical to the long-term success. The proposals are being evaluated by the selection panel, comprising representatives from each partner agency. The second RFP was published in December and focuses on physical design of the corridor and public spaces, as well as infrastructure improvement to realize the vision of the avenue as a venue and a great public space for everyday use. The proposals are due on Friday, March 1st, and we anticipate a large number of submissions that will inform the selection timeline. Next slide. This slide provides an outline of the tasks in each RFP leading up to the commission review and agency approval of the new plan in task seven. As you can see, the seven tasks are similar for each team. The IP team focusing on the task in blue and the design team focusing on task in green. This work will require a close coordination among subject matter experts that represent multiple disciplines. And by splitting the RFP into two pieces, we are able to maximize the expertise required to execute the comprehensive scope of work. Both teams will collaborate and coordinate their work iteratively through different phases of the project. 
Staff will return to the commission later this year to share more detail on the selected consultant team and their work plan. Next slide. Looking ahead at the timeline, we are in the middle of the procurement period noted in yellow. We anticipate starting work with the first consultant team in February and the second team in early summer when we brief the commission on the work plan. The first step is to build on the three early concepts and public comments received and to continue meeting with stakeholders to refine these concepts. This will be the basis to initiate NEPA and Section 106 in 2025, at which time the public will have multiple opportunities to provide input on the concept design alternative. Our goal is to present the new plan to the Commission for review in 2026, the year of America's 250th anniversary. And once approved, certain aspects of the new plan will require legislative action before implementation. While the plan is under development, the partners are also interested in learning from the fun and inspirational demonstration events taking place on the avenue. Next slide. For example, the Capital Pride Festival in June and Walk with a Mall in September. We are also working with Destination DC and Park Service to advocate for special events on the avenue in 2026. This concludes my presentation. I will stay on to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Jamuat. We appreciate that. Are there questions from any of commissioners? Any questions? Well, hearing none, then I'm going to um, start the discussion in round robin fashion, and we begin with Commissioner Mina Wright. Oh, I didn't know you were going to do that. I don't. No. I, <laughs> gosh, what a long, strange trip it's been. Um, it's it it does feel like we've been at this for a long time, but I and I'm very sorry that I won't be here to see it come to fruition. Um, mm. But I have every faith in um, in the team and, and getting this done. I do. I I did not know, um, however, that that the mayor had included it um, in her economic development plan. Or I don't know. Maybe I garbled that, Jeff. What was the plan that she? That, that she included in? Uh, the comeback plan and the downtown action oh, the, plan. Yeah, the come, okay. We, we, I, there's so many plans afoot that I get confused about which is which. But um, in any event, I, I understand that that uh, um, responses to an RFP are forthcoming. Um, and um, I can't wait to see what happens next. Very good. Okay, and next. Um, on the list, I'm sorry, uh, is Commissioner Dixon. Fine, thank you. A good presentation. It's uh, very exciting to see this happen. And I was on the first Pennsylvania Avenue Development Plan many years ago. So I just, I think it's good to see this change. I can't wait. Just can't wait to see what they're going to come up with. Thanks for the presentation. Well done. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. Commissioner Cash is not here, I, I presume. Um, That's correct. Neither is okay. Commissioner Davis. Okay. Uh, then Commissioner Cicchetti. I know comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Cicchetti. Commissioner Kozar. Uh, good afternoon and happy new year uh, to everyone. Um, uh, appreciate the presentation and even more appreciate uh, the great collaboration and partnership uh, with NCPC about this. And yes, um, this was included in the mayor's comeback plan, which you can think of as kind of a comprehensive economic development strategy of sorts. Um, for the next five years, it takes care of the whole diamond of the district. Um, and then the downtown action plan is really the one that's focused uh, most exclusively on our downtown. So um, excited about particularly the energy um, and the visualizations that have been so strong and excited about having um, additional consulting help for uh, NCPC to strengthen those even more because in many ways for the downtown, 
what's necessary is those visualizations that really help people uh, think about what could be, what, what, uh, what we can manifest, that kind of thing. So thank you all for the great work, the partnership, and looking forward to what's ahead in 2024. Thank I guess, you. I did have one question. Um, sorry, wrong section. Uh, if, if there's anything that the commissioners can do to be supportive of this going forward, uh, but would be happy to know about that as well. Good question. Thank you, Commissioner Kozar. Did you want um, Mr. Jamuwat to respond to that now or Mark, perhaps uh, Director Acosta? However, staff want to handle it is fine with me. Okay, that's good. Well, then I'll move along. And um, thank you, Commissioner Cozart. And we'll have Commissioner McMahon please um, respond. Hey, sure. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, not not a whole lot of comments. A great presentation. And uh, as uh, Commissioner Cozart says, it's uh, been a, and uh, Commissioner Miners, uh, Mina, excuse me, Commissioner Wright, um, a long term effort here and continue to see building out what we've done in the past. And and I think using uh, obviously 250th anniversary is a great lead into trying to get some work accomplished here uh, sooner than we typically do uh, uh, in this country of ours. So thanks again. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon. Thank you very much. Commissioner Stidham. Uh, thank you and happy new year. Um, we are excited for the collaboration um, and to explore the possibilities for Pennsylvania Avenue um, with everyone um, and look forward to the project moving forward as we continue throughout the new year. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stidham. Commissioner Argo. Nothing much else to say except except how um, ah, how wonderful it is to see the fruition that's coming here and the you know what appears to me to be a, a, a really superior collaborative effort. Um, to bring us to this point. So kudos to um, all that were involved. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Commissioner Hewlett. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jamawat, for your presentation. Um, I echo the sentiments of everyone who has already spoken. I just think it's exciting and just fascinating and can't wait. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Hewlett. And Commissioner Green. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the presentation. I look forward to um, watching this project develop and um, I can't think of a more important street in America and um, uh, and very much looking forward to um, um, the development of this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Green. And I just want to say and recognize the work of those commissioners who have been here for a long time and have worked so hard on this because I'm new, but it is an impressive project and it was exciting today to hear about the progress that's been made on the signature project. And, um, you know, we have once in a lifetime opportunities to elevate our nation's most important street in this way and um, to be recognized worldwide and, you know, coming from a relatively small town in the Midwest, main streets are critical to the vibrancy and the life and the future of a community. They are where our stories are told. And for those of us who live out here in the hinterlands, the main, the main street, Pennsylvania Avenue is a place that's recognizable, not just in, in our country, but worldwide. And so uh, I feel particularly honored to at least be coming in on the tail end of this uh, incredible project. I think what is um, probably um, more impressive than even the project itself is this partnership that has has brought it to fruition and um again something we learn in small towns and large in large communities and even in the nation's capital is that partnership is the way of the future we have to do this to survive and i just am edified by the group that that has been working on this and the leadership that has been provided not just by um you know, other agencies and departments, but by particularly by the NCPC staff who have worked hard on this. So I just want to recognize them and thank them. So now we're moving to this juncture where the consultants will be on board uh, and we will continue to contribute to, to the shaping of this plan. Um, I am also very pleased that the mayor has included this um, in, in the downtown economic development, um, uh, economic health plan, and also the DC comeback plan. I mean, I think this is a just a wonderful wonderful example of partnership befitting the nation's main street. So just want to congratulate everyone 
on, on the work done here and also the GSA for helping to secure the funding for this work. And we look forward to future updates. So thank you very much. Are there any further uh, comments or questions? Yes. Um, sorry, I you sprung it on me, so I wasn't ready. <laughs> um, I do have one thing to say, uh, or, 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 or a, a final plea to make. And the people who've been on the team for the last eight years are sick of listening to me say this. But if there's anything I've learned in 40 years, it's that people are not necessarily um, um, good at or, or who outside of our, our profession, people have a very difficult time imagining physical plans. So spend some money, <clears throat> not just on, on you know, Revit uh, drawings or, or, or the like. Hire yourself a really good artist mm. who can do some beautiful watercolor, specifically, or uh, renderings to help people imagine what the avenue can be. Um, it, it's, it's just no better way to, to sell an idea. And people are shy about admitting that they can't read a plan or a section or what have you. So, so make it easy for them and get and 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 really invest in the imagery. I think um, that's what sold some of the concepts when we first got going um, with the three alternatives. And I think when you get to 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 a detailed plan, a buildable plan. I mean, okay, it's not going to be built overnight, but <clears throat> the legacy of this of this plan needs to be illustrated in in some really elegant beautiful um, pieces that that um, one day might be in the history books just like the Macmillan plan or the, <clears throat> and its brethren so um that's it thank you thank you very much I couldn't agree with you more are there any other comments from any commissioners no further comments. Hearing no further comments, we're going to move on to our next agenda item, which is 5B, and it's a presentation on the Pollinator Best Practices Resource Guide. Ms. Free is going to presentation, um, and I know that uh, Ms. Sullivan will also be available to help answer questions if, at the conclusion if we have uh, questions for staff. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. 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 Thank yes. you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Goodman and Commissioners. The purpose of this information presentation is to brief the Commission on a new Pollinator Best Practices Resource Guide. The guide was developed by staff to clarify how NCPC incorporates plants that support pollinators in its review of proposed projects. The guide will be located on NCPC's website along with a number of other existing resource guides. Resource guides provide an overview of specific topics related to NCPC's authorities, comprehensive plan policies, and plan review processes for use by staff and applicants. I'd like to underscore that resource guides do not create any new standards, and they are not policy documents. The Pollinator's Best Practices Resource Guide is purely intended to clarify existing guidance as it relates to our plan review, and bring existing best practices together in one place that can be referred to by applicants, staff, and the public. As you are aware, NCPC reviews landscape plans as part of site and building plan submissions. There is a lot of existing guidance and uh, fam familiarity about the importance of native plant species and their selection and their benefits. But more recently, we have heard a lot about including plants that support pollinators in landscape plans. So staff developed the Pollinator Best Practices Resource Guide to clarify how NCPC utilizes federal guidance to support pollin pollinator habitats in its review. In this presentation, I will cover the resource guide topics, which are listed here. And before I go into detail on what the guidance is, I will speak about what, what pollinators are and why we need plants that support them. <clears throat> First, a brief reminder of what a pollinator is and a, a little bit of plant biology 101. A pollinator is anything that helps to carry pollen from the male part of, a, part of a flower to the female part of the same flower or another flower. The movement of pollen must occur for the plant to produce fruits, seeds, and other young plants. 
Some plants are self-pollinated while many rely on external pollinators such as wind, water, or insects and animals for pollination. The focus of the resource guide and today's presentation are the best practices for selecting plants that support animal and insect pollinators, in particular bees and monarch butterflies, but this also includes wasps, moths, birds, flies, and small mammals. Pollinators are extremely important for the health and longevity of the human and natural environments. For example, at least 75% of all flowering plants on earth are pollinated by insects and animals. This amounts to more than 1,200 food crops and 100, 180,000 different types of plants that help to stabilize soil, clean air, supply oxygen, and support wildlife. Despite how valuable pollinators are, recent surveys have shown disturbing population declines in insect pollinator species across Europe and the United States. Beekeepers are losing an average of 40% of their managed European honeybee colonies every year, and monarch butterflies have declined 85% in two decades. Overall, the migrating monarch populations are less than half the size they need to be to avoid extinction. The cause of pollinator decline is attributed to several factors. Development of natural habitats fragments pollinator habitat. Invasive plant species degrade natural habitats by reducing plant biodiversity. Urban, suburban, and agricultural landscapes offer limited nesting sites. Diseases, parasites, exposure to pesticides, and a change in climate are all reasons for their decline. In 2014, President Obama issued a presidential memorandum titled Creating a Strategy to Promote the Health of Honeybees and Other Pollinators, which established the Pollinator Health Task Force, who was charged with developing a national strategy to promote the health of honeybees and other pollinators. Federal agencies used this guidance to establish their own policies to support pollinators. This includes a joint effort between GSA and CEQ titled Supporting the Health of Honeybees and Other Pollinators, and the USDA's Field Office Technical Guidance on Conservation Planting and Wildflower Habitat Establishment. NCPC defers to these resources for best practices when selecting plants that support pollinator habitats. The federal environment element of the comprehensive plan for the national capital also includes policy guidance to include the introduction of plants that support pollinator species. So with this federal guidance in hand, the resource guide provides an outline of what NCPC can do in its plan and project review and what agencies can do as plan preparers to support pollinators. And simply put, we can plant more plants that support pollinators. A healthy pollinator habitat consists of plants that will provide food, primarily in the form of pollen or nectar, shelter, nest sites and materials, and or larval hosts for pollinators and animal insects. As I mentioned, we already talk a good bit about native plants in our reviews. And I wanted to take a moment to point out that there is a lot of overlap between native plants and plants that are good for pollinators. Native plants are species that evolved and occur naturally in a particular region. Many of them have co-evolved with pollinators like bees and butterflies, since many plants and pollinators rely on each other for survival. Herbaceous flowering plants like the purple coneflower often come to mind uh, when one thinks about a pollinator plant. And flowering plants like this are very important for pollinators because they produce nectar, which is a pollinator food. However, native plants that support pollinators can also be trees, shrubs, perennials, vines, ground covers, grasses, sedges, and others as they provide some other benefits that I mentioned like shelter, nest sites, and larval hosts. On this slide here, we have a few images of native trees and shrubs that are popular hosts for butterfly and moth caterpillars in this region. That includes oak trees, maples, birches, and poplars. One native pollinator friendly plant that we have heard a lot about recently is milkweed. Milkweed is critically important because it is the only plant species that monarch caterpillars can eat. Therefore, without it, the monarch butterflies would go extinct. The monarch butterflies are important pollinators. They're the only butterfly species that completes a two-way migration across North America every year and play a critical part in sustaining ecosystems along the way. There are over 100 different species of milkweeds that are considered native to North America one of which stands out, Asclepia syriaca, or common milkweed. 
According to the US Forest Service, common milkweed is nature's mega food market for insects. The Forest Service goes on to say that it is amongst the most important food plants for monarch caterpillars. And it, it has even been identified by the Zierse Society as a priority species in monarch habitat restoration in the mid-Atlantic. Studies demonstrate that monarch butterflies lay more eggs in total when a diversity of milkweeds are present than when compared to the presence of a single species alone. They further suggest that planting the right milkweed species for the site can have massive impacts on the quality of milkweed plants, which influences where the monarchs choose to lay their eggs. Therefore, the resource guide recommends that a diversity of milkweed species, including common milkweed, should be planted on federal landscapes as appropriate for the site conditions. We also see a lot of native grasses and sedges proposed on plants, which are often overlooked when it comes to pollinator benefits because they're wind pollinated and they do not produce nectar. However, these native species serve an important role in pollinator habitats. They provide larval hosts and food, nesting materials and structure, and suppress weeds. Their bunching habit and extensive root systems also slow stormwater, reduce erosion, and sequester carbon. And in addition, they support other wildlife habitat for birds and small mammals. And here we have an example of four native grass species that are larval hosts for skipper, skipper butterflies and provide nesting materials and structure for native bees. They also serve as the foundation for a designed plant community with texture, structure, and seasonal interest. Sedges or carex species are another type of native plant that are packed with environmental benefits. Some provide pollen or larval hosts for pollinators, birds and small animals eat the seeds, and butterfly and moth caterpillars enjoy the leaves. Sedges also provide habitat value to invertebrates, reptiles and amphibians, and are very adaptable. They're a very adaptable plant for stormwater management. Many can even be mown and used in place of turf grass as seen here in the top image. And the bottom image here, we have a rendering from the National Desert Shield and Desert Storm Memorial final submission, which was reviewed by the commission in December of 2022. A native carex is proposed on the backside of the dune-like berms. So in this next section of the presentation, I'll briefly summarize the best practices for selecting plants that benefit pollinators in both meadow and non-meadow or designed landscapes. Sometimes we see meadow landscapes on plants, which are which are largely field, fields that are dominated by wildflowers and grasses. But more often we are reviewing designed landscapes, which includes cultural or commemorative landscapes, gathering spaces and recreation areas. Here we have a planting diagram plan from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing Project, which has naturalized pollinator meadows around the periphery of the site. Designed landscape spaces like seating areas and bioretention are proposed closer to the building and in the parking areas, many of which are dominated by trees, shrubs, perennials, and grasses that benefit pollinators. For metal landscapes, the resource guide summarizes guidance from the USDA's 2022 Maryland Conservation Planting Guide and 2023 Maryland Wildflower Habitat Establishment Guide. This guidance recommends that meadows consist of 100% native plant species with 85 to 90% wildflowers and 10 to 15% grasses. In a meadow where monarch butterfly habitat is the primary purpose, at least one and a half percent native milkweeds should be planted as food for the caterpillars, and 60% of the wildflowers planted should be species that can provide nectar for the butterflies. It also recommends that at least three plant species from each bloom period, that being spring, summer, and fall, are specified to provide consistent and adequate resources throughout the growing season. For non-meadow and designed landscapes, the resource guide lists recommendations from supporting the health of honeybees and other pollinators. Here we have an example of a designed landscape, the Constitution Gardens Rehabilitation Project, where such best practices would apply in NCPC's review. These best practices include choosing plants native to the project's ecoregion, selecting the right plant for the site, the use of some non-native plants as long as they're not invasive, selecting at least three plant species from each bloom period, considering all types of plants, such as trees, shrubs, perennials, and grasses, responsible seed acquisition, and taking care when selecting cultivars. 
The resource guide also acknowledges that NCPC must balance the need to maintain historic, cultural, or commemorative significance with the demands for ecological sustainability. Here we have an example of a recently reviewed project, the Resilience Plaza at the US Department of Homeland Security headquarters, where the proposed landscape plan did not include milkweed because milkweed was not identified in the site's cultural landscape report. However, 50% of the plant material proposed provides other pollinator benefits, consisting of native trees, sedges, shrubs, and perennials, with at least nine different plant species for each bloom period. So overall, the primary takeaway from the resource guide is that biodiversity is key to a healthy pollinator habitat. Biodiversity is important to any healthy ecosystem. It provides resiliency in the event that a pest or disease or climate changes develop that are detrimental to a specific species. A healthy pollinator habitat will provide food and shelter, larval hosts, nesting materials or sites, which may be provided by a diversity of plant types. Native flowering plants are especially important as they produce nectar, which attracts and feeds pollinators and encourages pollination. And as discussed, common milkweed and other native milkweed should be planted to the fullest extent possible and as appropriate for the site to support monarch caterpillars and butterflies who are critically important pollinators. The resource guide includes citations throughout its text from credible resources such as the Penn State Extension and other state university research centers, the Xerces Society, the National Park Service, and the US Forest Service, amongst others. It also includes a section on additional applicant resources, many of which are listed here, uh, with links to federal documents, recommended plant lists, and mixtures, and studies on this topic. And while information presentations are not available for public comment, staff has completed outreach with particularly interested parties, including individuals who have signed up to speak about supporting pollinators at commission meetings. We did not receive any substantial comments and we have worked with the individuals to address any concerns and incorporate their comments into the guide. So this concludes my presentation. Um, I thank you for your time and I am available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Free. We appreciate that excellent presentation. Do commissioners have any questions at this time? Do commissioners have any questions? Well, hearing none, we're gonna move on then to commission discussion. And if you would, if you haven't turned on your camera, please do. And I'm gonna begin with Vice Chair Hewlett. Um, if you could uh, please uh, share your, your thoughts on this uh, presentation. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, Ms. Free, for your the presentation um, and also for your diligence in working with the very all the interested parties in this topic. Mm -hmm. It's very important. And you listened intently uh, and you embraced some of the, the suggestions that we've heard from others. And I can't thank you enough for that. Um, I think this is exciting, it's important, and I've learned a lot during this entire process, so thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Hewlett. Um, I would like to ask uh, Commissioner Green now to please uh, share your thoughts. Thank you very much for your presentation, that was terrific. And especially in light of some of the questions we've had at recent meetings, it'll be really wonderful to have this, this great report at hand um, for all future pro projects. So thank you very much for your work on this. Thank you, Commissioner Green, Commissioner Wright. I don't have any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon. I very much appreciate the report. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon, Commissioner Cash, and Commissioner Davis. I um, will continue to move on, uh, not, uh, not seeing them present. Uh, Commissioner Giacchetti. No comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Giacchetti. Commissioner Cozart. Uh, thank you to the staff for their work on this and for the presentation today. Thank you. Commissioner Cozart, Commissioner McMahon. Thanks, uh, and thanks to the staff for the, the great report today. More importantly, and as a reflect that uh, disappointing that our two consent items today were consent and not for presentation uh, from NIH, both had long sections in it to discuss their efforts to provide this kind of uh, native uh, environment for butterflies. So obviously the work they're doing, 
with uh, everybody who does work in, in the National Capital Region that comes to NCPC is listening. So I congratulate them and look forward to see more of these in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McMahon and Commissioner Stidham. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we were able to review in advance and provided some comments. Um, I, I, and I, I understand this is to be a living document, which I think is great because I think that things will evolve um, as time goes on, especially with the fact that the mob uh, is proposed to be. Oh, commissioners, um, and I look at what am I back? Yeah, you're back. Um, I think it's important as as other federal agencies um, develop their strategies based on that base strategy um, that we include them um, uh, to be sure that we're covering all our bases and that this is a guide and 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 it's used as we do these projects. So, thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stidham. Commissioner Argo. I think this is uh, it is really, really interesting and uh, and exciting thinking about the, uh, the possibilities. And my one thought, I don't want to take up time on this now, but is how um, I'm thinking about um, how we trickle down some of this information um to really uh it, i live in washington dc um talking about the you know literally getting information down at the neighborhood um you know almost the anc levels um it could i think it is is great information for people to have especially as they think about work that's being done on their own property <laughs> as well as um properties in in their neighborhoods um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Argo. Um, and I'll just add a few, a few remarks. I just want to, again, thank the staff um, for the good work that's been done on this and thank the public that has come and consistently brought this to, to the attention of the NCPC. I think that their contributions help um, inform our work oftentimes, although this has been um, established work by the, by the federal government, it still is good to hear from people about it, this is wonderful work. And I think it reminds us that, uh, you know, we live in an interconnected world and our interconnectedness um, um, relies on uh, mutual respect, if you will. And I know that um, all of these uh, projects and programs that we are seeing will have landscaping and there are things that we don't even measure yet, but the impact on, on workforce um, and on the people who vi both visit and work in these environments, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of benefit from just being around um, natural environments, not to mention the benefits to the pollinators and and all all the rest of the birds and the bees. So um, do appreciate this presentation, and it will be incredibly helpful to our applicants as they come before us. And thank you, Commissioner McMahon, for pointing out um, the important uh, projects that were in the consent um, agenda that that included uh, aspects of this landscape. So thank you, uh, uh, landscape guidance. So thank you very much. And uh, are there any additional questions for Ms. Free? Hearing none, the last uh, agenda item today is the information presentation on NCPC Centennial. And um, Ms., um, or Ms., Ms. Gebby will be making the presentation. Are, are you ready? I am. Can you all see me? See and hear me? Yes, we can see and hear you. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'll get started. Good afternoon, commissioners. 2024 is in full swing and NCPC turns the big 100 this year. We are all very excited about that. Um, and I'm excited to share an overview of how we'll be celebrating this amazing milestone. Our staff has put together a range of exciting and thoughtful products and events. Before I present them to you, I'd like to first share some reflections from former chairs and commissioners on their aspirations for Washington and the region that we gathered as part of our centennial oral history project. Please enjoy these reflections and I'll resume the presentation right after. National Capital Planning Commission must see and plan the district's future so that our capital continues being the beacon of 
of freedom that the world sees. The thing that we recognize, I said it earlier in this interview, mm -hmm. that make Washington recognizable mm -hmm. is the monumentality of the city itself uh, that says this is the capital of the most powerful nation in the world. Um, I think care and concern probably has to continue to be exerted um, even more vigorously with what happens in the uh, between the big bones of the city itself, the big monuments and the streets and the avenues that are there with neighborhoods. I want DC and the region to be a destination. I want people to come here, not just to find out a little bit more about their country and about how it got started, but to learn about what's possible when people from all different backgrounds and all different walks of life come and work and live together. Washington, D.C. has to show resilience and flexibility in its future growth. Um, you know, the changes in technology, the changes in the way we move, the way we work, the way we connect with one another, the way we communicate with each other are all vital to how the commission can help guide and lead uh, the legacy of, of, of Washington uh, to the future. Of all places, it's our nation's capital that should be that beacon of why it's important to understand that if you don't have diversity, you don't have a healthy ecosystem. That comes to, you know, what, whether you're talking about flora and fauna or you're talking about a city and its people, Great. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you, Tony. All right. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yes, we so, can. Um, wonderful. So um, I hope you enjoyed hearing from some of your predecessors um, this sentiment from former Chair Libby Rogue that you see up on the slide also captures NCPC's awesome responsibility in the region over the past 100 years and into the future. It's very hard virtually. We wish we were all in person for all of us as a staff to be able to communicate how excited we are to celebrate this, um, to celebrate our centennial. But we've kept this sentiment center of mind as we have conceptualized how to commemorate this milestone. And I'll go ahead and walk you through. Uh, when considering our agency's history, we organized it into three time periods characterized by key congressional acts that established or affected the agency's authority and duties. In 1924, Congress established the National Capital Park Commission, which later became the National Capital Park and Planning Commission, to acquire parkland, preserve the natural scenery, and prevent pollution of Rockby Park and our rivers. In 1952, the National Capital Planning Act gave NCPC its current name and the authority to plan for all of Washington, both local and federal. And Home Rule in 1974 established a unique shared system of planning between the district and NCPC. Uh, our centennial offers a unique opportunity, opportunity to reflect on this history. More than that, it also offers a chance to examine the evolution of planning in Washington and the region, acknowledge inequities created by past planning practices, and consider lessons learned to inform planning today and into the future. Our staff has planned a variety of ways to engage diverse audiences on NCPC's historic role in the region's planning. We are kicking things off with an online event called One Night, 100 Years on the evening of January 23rd. We're inviting six thought-provoking professionals that, uh, who you can see listed here to discuss a transformational plan developed by NCPC and its impact on the region. Our speakers were asked to choose from our new online planning library, which we developed for the centennial and that I'll introduce shortly. Uh, this event will be a fun, fast round of presentations with diverse viewpoints, and we encourage you all to attend. 
Here's a look at some of our other events that we have planned for the year to engage audiences generally interested in our region, as well as other members of the public with professional and academic interest in planning and our agency. In April at the DC History Conference, we'll explore the complicated legacy of NC, a former NCPC chair, Harlan Bartholomew, a national planning pioneer, and also uh, a proponent of efforts that resulted in institutionalized um, segregation and racialized displacement. In May, at the American Planning Association's Federal Planning Division Conference, we'll explore the impact of federal planning in the capital city and the region. On June 6, which is the actual day of our centennial, we'll launch our physical exhibit, which I'll describe shortly at the Martin Luther King Jr. Library with a speaker event. And the conversation will focus on the years from 1952 to 74, where debates in Washington about transportation, urban renewal, and civic engagement shaped the form of Washington and mirrored this broader national conversation. Mm -hmm. And in September at the APA's National Capital Area Chapter Conference, we'll close out the year with a reflective panel discussion on how past planning practices have shaped the region, lessons learned, and pathways for the future. In addition to our events, I am really excited to introduce our online planning library, which is a collection of influential plans, legislation, and maps with an emphasis on the uh, maps that shape the region's development with an emphasis on items from 1924 to 1974. We developed this resource with the DC Office of Planning due to our share due to our shared planning history up until 1974. The library is designed to be an evergreen resource accessible to the public with great effort. Staff members identify 300 plus items and the library currently houses over 300 items. As staff continue to conduct research on various projects, we will be updating current entries and adding new ones. Staff also work diligently to develop a robust library application that features easy navigation, filters, sorting, and a keyword search. We've soft launched the library and gotten really positive feedback on its usability and catalog. Um, we encourage you to, to browse the library and we look forward to hearing more from you and the public about this great tool. I'll just walk you through an example of what you can find in the library. Here's the entry for a policies plan for the new year, excuse me, a policies plan for the year 2000, the nation's capital developed in 1961 by NCPC and the National Regional Planning Council. The viewer will find a description of the plan, which conceived of the region being defined by wedges and corridors of open space and development. Each entry has a carousel of, of images, including this one for this entry, which shows how corridors would comprise of development hubs linked by a rapid mass transit route and parallel highway. There's also a link to a Washington Post news article about the plan, and of course, a link to download the plan. Uh, there's lots more great material in the library and you are encouraged to check it out. In partnership with the DC Public Library, NCPC is, is preparing exhibits to share stories from the past 100 years with an emphasis on the first 50 years of the agency's history leading up to home rule. The physical exhibit will first be displayed at Martin Luther King Jr. Library in June 2024 and then move to other neighborhood libraries. A companion digital exhibit will allow visitors a deeper dive, dive into the themes and stories presented in the physical exhibit. The exhibit will explore NCPC's early years, which include the agency's role in creating the region's incredible park system and open spaces. Washington was also a proving ground and laboratory for ideas about modern planning, including zoning, comprehensive plans, and the big ideas that led to highways and urban renewal in the mid-century. A key proponent of these ideas was Harlan Bartholomew, a national planning pioneer and former NCPC chair, whose legacy will also be explored in some of our events. The exhibits will confront the consequences of these planning efforts, including displacement, often of African-American communities and sprawl. Mm -hmm. There was community opposition to many of these top-down sweeping plans. The commission reflected this struggle with a slow turn towards mass transit and historic preservation. Former NCPC chair Libby Rowe was a champion of this evolution in planning. Lastly, the exhibits will explore how planning became a shared responsibility with the district following home rule and how the commission took on new and evolving issues and is still trying to achieve the balance between local and federal interests. As you can see, there's lots that will be unpacked in the exhibits. The final product I'll describe is our oral history project. 
As you saw from the video clip at the start of my presentation, we conducted oral history interviews with former chairs, commissioners, and staff regarding their experiences and reflections on working with the commission. These oral histories will serve as critical resources for future generations to better understand the unique history and evolution of planning in the nation's capital. The public will be able to browse the complete transcripts housed on our Centennial website. And we're also creating additional compilation video clips with highlights from certain interviews. Uh, we'll share them with the public throughout the year. We'll be promoting the centennial and engaging the public through social media campaigns, our beloved field notes, and appearances at popular events. And we invite you to visit the centennial website to access all of our offerings, including the planning library and oral histories, and stay up to date on all of our events. That concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Gabby, and we appreciate all the work that's going into this. And I will now ask the commissioners if they have any questions. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and uh, begin discussion and using round robin uh, format. I'm going to begin with Commissioner Cozart, please. Um, you know, like the other commissioners, when you first call on them, I'm not ready. <laughs> Here I am, and thank you all. Um, uh, this is an impressive lineup, um, and uh, I'm excited. Uh, we get a chance to kind of reflect, um, and this may be a way for us to continue to get more people interested and involved in the work of the commission. So uh, appreciate your thoughtfulness about it, um, the breadth of offerings, and excited to um, uh, engage with you on as many of them as, as possible. So thank you for your great work on this and, and um, glad that uh, we're making time for this, this look, look back and look ahead. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Cozart. I appreciate it, <clears throat> your comments and your willingness to be first. I will say, I just have to have footnote this. Um, we all have um, Ms. Coster to thank for the order of these um, uh, discussion points. I threw her under the bus. I apologize. But anyway, it's a new year, so I had to reveal that secret. <laughs> anyway, Commissioner McMahon. Well, I'm glad to volunteer to be number two. Um, <laughs> but thank you. No, great presentation and uh, looking forward to an interesting year of uh, Looking back and looking forward for NCPC, led by the staff, they've done great work. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Stidham. I, I think this work is just great. I mean, the commission has been around and done so much over the years, and I think that gets lost over time. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity over the holidays yeah, to just look at the website and the compilation of the materials, the old plans, old documents, um, a few things I've been looking for myself, actually. Um, so it was it, that that was a huge task to pull all that together and um, putting it into a timeline um, is just amazing work. So so great work, and I look forward to uh, the celebration to come. Thank you, Commissioner Stidham. Commissioner Argo. Yeah, um, all I echo all the um, compliments that uh, that we've heard and. I know personally, it um, makes me want to dive deeper into uh, some of the things that we've heard about today. Just you know, as a you know, as a commission member, as a as a longtime district resident, and um, it to uh, you know to take and, and to think about some of the additional kind of practical applications to some of the things that um, have been presented to us and how we uh, share some of them also more broadly. So thank you. Thank you for all the good work, staff. Thank you. That's thank it. you. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Argo. Thank you very much. And uh, Vice Chair Hewlett, please. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you for the presentation as well. I, this is this is really an exciting time for us, and uh, it's just to hear the history, just to 
Um, and I too was piqued. My curiosity was piqued. So not only did we have the report that was sent and, and I printed out, but um, it, it caused me to go back and look at some more. I am as a fairly newbie on the board. I mean, there's just so much more to knowledge to acquire. And each time, you know, you, you, your chest, you stick your chest out a little bit further and further because the commission does so much. And it's important to preserve that history and to tell our story, to share that story so that, uh, that everyone knows. Um, so thank you so very much for all the work you're doing. I just can't wait, uh, starting with uh, January when I, we watch the uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Hewlett. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> Commissioner Green, please. Thank you very much. Now, I, I look forward to these events this year, and this is this is going to be a great experience. And um, thank you to the staff. I know it's been a lot of time and effort to pull these together and um, and just really appreciate it and looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Green. Commissioner Wright. Well, gosh. This is a huge opportunity to teach people what planning is about. Planning, this is heresy for this group, but people think planning is boring and they don't understand it. And it sometimes is, let's face it. Some of it is pretty arcane and, and pretty abstract and, and we're, we're not very good as humans um, at thinking um, um, temporally, in other words, in far into the future, it becomes more and more abstract, just like your physical vision, right? Things are far away, you can't see details, it becomes quite blurry. And I think one of the things that really helps people to understand is negative examples. In, and by that, I mean, um, you know, when you go to art school, they teach you, um, at least when I, where, where I went, they teach you to draw the negative space. It's a different way of showing people, um, of teaching, teaching artists how to look at things. So when you're looking at a still life, you draw the air around it instead of the objects. Um, why am I going off in this direction? Um, because we have to teach people this is a great opportunity to, to show them examples of what happens in the absence of planning. Because sometimes people just don't get the, the examples that you give them. See, there was this great plan and it came about and this is what NCPC did about it. Or, or this is the role that NCPC played in it. Um, I think some examples of what, what happens, what would happen, were NCPC not to be around, were the were, were planning functions or, or were planners to just drop off the face of the earth, what 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 would happen is a good way to illustrate um, why it's so important. People get what it is when something bad is happening in their neighborhood. We all know what NIMBY is about, but but in the larger picture and in the composition of the city, I'm not sure that, that Joe Q. Citizen is, is all that familiar. So this is a huge opportunity to educate and, yeah, a little self-serving, garner support for the commission. And, and then I just want to make one more point, because um, as I've been saying, I'm, I'm quite philosophical these days and reflective, and I think about... Um, for people in the future who have jobs like mine and, and Commissioner McMahon's and, and Commissioner Stidham's, the land owning agencies of the federal government are not always um, able or disposed to um, best practice. Um, in, in that what, what we would call best practice in design and planning. And, and without the healthy, a really healthy and robust ecosystem in design and planning in the district um, or the DMV in broader terms, our jobs would be that much harder. And, and, I, and I'm, I think that the DOD and the Park Service might agree with me. Sometimes I, I have to use the, the NCPC CFA SHPO ecosystem, the, the, the review 
an approval system as a cudgel to 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 beat my own colleagues into submission to do the right thing. So this is really, really important. And and the centennial is a is a, a is a once in a lifetime opportunity to flex a little. And I encourage you to to do that. Thank you very much, Commissioner Wright. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon. Uh, first, thanks to the staff for the hard work that they've done already and more that they will be doing. Uh, I also apologize to them for not being able, having time or capacity to review some of the from my work, from my work, some of the stuff I said that would have been maybe maybe useful if I had been able to do that. But that's all done. That's done. I'm also blessed and honored, or honored and blessed, to have been a part thirty years of the fifty of the one hundred years and maybe more. Uh, with the commission and having known all of the speakers who at least spoke as former chairs and and others who did not speak but uh i i think it, it's just to, it's great that we're documenting it i believe we cannot without looking back we cannot move forward with vision and planning can't have vision in our planning if we don't look back and respect reflect on what's happened to get us here i also think that uh this is a a a, a very significant statement of how we as a very uh, home ruleless community uh, have operated in a planning environment with the most powerful government in the world. And we've been able to come together in a planning operation that mm -hmm. has respected those turfs, I think, in a, in a very uh, sensitive manner. Uh, I think that we've been able to do that. And I think that's a very, very powerful image, uh, one that could be used in many places now across the globe, where powerful forces can control small areas where people are somewhat home, home rulers, as, as we have been. I say home rulers, we have home rule, but we don't, we're still looking for a stronger form of it. So I thank them for the work. I'm looking forward to all of this. Hopefully I'll be able to, to participate and see, see this as it goes forward. And I will be, I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dixon. And Commissioner Cicchetti. Thank you very much. No, this is a very exciting uh, opportunity, but uh, no, no comments or questions from me. Thanks, Great. everybody. Great, okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner Cicchetti. And I just wanna begin by, again, I just thanking the staff, you know, when you think about the backbone, of so many federal agencies and some of which you all participate in and work for, you know, you know, the kind of work that goes into maintaining federal, federal agencies and, and staff and departments and all of the work. So I do want to just really congratulate the staff uh, who have worked so hard on this. And I also want to thank um, as a new, as a newbie, as, as Commissioner Green said, as a newbie, um, I want to thank the commissioners who have been here for, for a long time, Commissioner Wright, Commissioner Dix, and others. I, I'll forget Commissioner McMahon, others who have been here for, for many <clears throat> years, and also our partners from the district. You know, your your leadership is important, too, at least uh, to me as a, as a new chair. And I've spent much of the last year, you know, past is prologue, as, as Commissioner Dixon mentioned, um, and I've spent the last year reading a lot about Macmillan and a lot about L'Enfant and the planning that went into this tremendous uh, place we call our national capital. And, and now I'm looking forward to this year to be able to consume the products that our staff have created that bring the 20th century to light and, and demonstrate how, um, you know, folks just like us have have worked hard to be consistent with that, um, that aspirational vision of America and of our national capital. And I do acknowledge, you know, we've learned a lot. We've learned about many of the inequities that have occurred through planning in the past. And we're working hard to, um, I think, uh, uh, amend those to, to create a capital and, and, and uh, planning projects and programs of the future that are going to address those inequities. And also keep the whole concept of beauty in mind that was part of the original design of this place. Um, I also think we need to continue to keep an eye on the resiliency, uh, climate resiliency piece of this to make sure that what we're planning and building and protecting here is, is protected. So 
All of those things come to mind as I look forward to this year anniversary, but mostly I just want to thank staff and and thank, um, you know, the commissioners who've served for such a long time and commissioners who pre um, were here before us. And and I'm looking forward to the important conversation with the public about this and, and talking about the challenges and the opportunities they had. So I just want to thank you um, for the presentation today, all of you. Uh, and um, and for a lovely new year and a short meeting to begin the year because next month is going to be really um, a, an exciting again an exciting meeting and planning but it'll be a little longer I think so. Hearing um, no other questions, does anyone have any more comments or questions uh, before we conclude? But this concludes our open session and the next meeting will be on February first at one p.m. And I uh, look forward to seeing all of you at that time. And, and if there's no further business, um, we will stand adjourned. <laughs>